your life Whether you're ready or not Sometimes it's rough And it takes all that you've got But he's been here Just waiting for you to knock To take his hand And plant your feet on the rock I want you to Hi, welcome to Life on the Rock. And tonight on Life on the Rock, we have the intelligentsia of the church. We have six uh, young men on fire for the Lord. We have a, a PhD, a doctorate in physics and math and music and humanities, philosophy. They have more degrees than a thermometer, Doug. You guessed it. <laughs> We're talking about Dominicans. Dominicans are in the house, St. Joseph's Province, the Eastern Province of the United States. They're doing great work. We've had a lot of Dominicans on the show over the year. They're doing Great apostolic outreach in different areas. Now, are the other religious orders watching right now thinking, Dominicans, I was thinking that's Benedictines or that's Franciscans. <laughs> I mean, do you, do you think maybe we insulted the other orders? No, I'm a Franciscan. I, I humbly <laughs> bow before their, their studies. Uh, they're learned in Thomas, and they, they bring a certitude to things. That's very refreshing. So. Okay. Yeah. Good to see you, Doug. You too, Potter. You know, last week we were talking about the universal call to holiness. See? And... Uh, this week, I wanted to mention, too, about um, the need for grace. When I think of November, we think of the praying for the holy souls in purgatory, right. and we see uh, that there's a real growth in our sanctification, a growth in holiness as necessary, right? right? If, we, if we die you know, or state of grace, we go to purgatory, if we need to be purified and um, any remnants of sin, vestiges there. Uh, and if we're not in the state of grace... We don't talk about that. We, we <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's too scary. Yeah. We go, but we go to hell. Right. To right. die in the state of unrepentant mortal sin causes right. the loss of Christ's kingdom, the eternal death of hell. Paragraph 1861 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. To lose sanctifying grace, we do that through committing a mortal sin. Right. And sanctifying grace is reinstated back in the soul. Woohoo! Mm -hmm. To the sacrament of confession, reconciliation. Right. Yeah. Powerful. But that grace is essential for holiness. Right. Yeah. That's right. the point here, right? Right. And I, I remember in my own journey, I remember learning about this, uh, like reading the Baltimore Catechism, and you know, they make it so clear mm -hmm. there. And it's like, well, if you want to be holy, you need grace, right? How do we get grace yeah. in life? Well, first through the sacraments, right? The, the document I was reading to, from last week, Lumen Gentium on the church, it speaks about, uh, you know, having a, a lively faith, of course, that goes uh, to the Eucharist, frequent participation in the sacred action of the liturgy, application of oneself to prayer, to self-denial, lively fraternal service, mm -hmm. constant exercise of all the virtues, you know, especially charity, the bond of perfection. So we can think of service, prayerful reading, meditating on the scriptures, the sacraments of the big, I call them like avenues, channels of mm -hmm. grace into our life, uh, go to confession regularly, receive grace, uh, to overcome our sin and our weakness, not just the forgiveness of sins, but also that grace necessary to become holy. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we've lost, to some degree, a concept of grace and merit. Obviously, we have to be real careful when we speak about such things, but the Catholic Church does have a concept of merit, right, that we can merit God's grace. It says, since the initiative belongs to God in the order of grace, no one can merit the initial grace of forgiveness and justification at the beginning of conversion, so they're saying, like, before you're baptized, if you say an adult, right, he can't merit that grace of conversion. That's just a free gift. But he said, you know, after that point, moved, we're baptized, right? So we're moved by the Holy Spirit and by charity. We can then merit for ourselves and for others the graces needed for our sanctification, for the increase of grace and charity, and for the attainment of eternal life. Even temporal goods like health and friendship can be merited in accordance with God's wisdom. These graces and goods are the object of Christian prayer. Prayer attends to the grace we need for meritorious action. So by God's Holy Spirit, you know, working in us, even that merit's a gift, a grace of God. That, but His working in us, you know, we can merit these additional graces of sanctification. So yeah. it matters what I do. You know, if I spend time in prayer, if I spend time in 
in charitable service towards other, if I'm faithful to my state in life, my vocation, what I'm called to do, that's meritorious. We grow in our holiness. Yeah, reading scripture, devotions, mm -hmm. um, yeah. receiving the sacraments, uh, confession, Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. um, and, and instead of looking at grace as I did for many years of my life as a thing, kind of like a protein for the muscle or carbohydrate for the body or vitamins and minerals, um, there's something living about it. Mm -hmm. There's something very, very um, uh, encountering of Christ about grace that is phenomenal. I remember a priest telling me that in marriage, your marriage, this sacrament of marriage has an active living grace, almost like this energy that's, that's flowing through this sphere, this entity of your marriage that is just ongoing. Mm -hmm. And the priest had said to me, so call on it, know that mm -hmm. it's there. And grace has a transformative power, as you were saying, not right. just to sustain us, right. but to change us, transform us, and continually yeah. bring us to a higher level right. of perfection in God's design. Right. Well, Christ is present in your marriage by yeah. virtue of the sacrament. Yeah. So he and strengthens it's, you. And it's a living, right. it's a living energy right. of some yeah. sort. That's, yeah. I never looked at it that way. Because we hear about marriage as being a give and take. And it's a, you know, you get along with your spouse. And I don't want to just get along with my spouse. I want there to be that, 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 that zeal and that mm -hmm. fire for each other's souls and each other's lives. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's, that's active through the grace that God provides mm -hmm. in that marriage. Yeah, the catechism speaks of it as a, as a gift and a participation in the very life of God. So that's the key word for our Catholic view of morality and mm -hmm. sanctification is participation in the life of God that he calls us to himself through these encounters. He incorporates us into his mystical body and we have that soul of the Holy Spirit, so to speak, yeah. you know, working in us in, the, in that mystical body. Yeah. So I think those are good things because you know, we begin the month of November with All, so All Saints Day and we're looking at the goal. We're asking for their prayers, but they're also exhorting us, you know, live deeply, mm. go for it. Yeah. You know, there's a group of people that have made it, right? Aim and higher. Aim there's, higher. There's a book by right. that title, Aim, Aim higher. higher. That's right. You know? So Don't settle. Don't be a minimalist. Right. You know, strive for something greater right. in Christ because it can be done in Christ. And there's things we can do to open ourselves up to this beautiful gift of God's grace. So we're going to take a short break. Don't go away. We'll be back in a moment with the Dominicans. So stay tuned. <laughs>
think I want to be a Dominican now. After <laughs> <seeing>. <laughs> well, we have a, a rock house full of Dominicans, all in formation, studying for the priesthood. We have a couple deacons, a couple of you all are in final vows, but most of you are in temporary vows, been in three to five years. Maybe we can just start at the, with Brother Peter, if you can just introduce yourselves and uh, where are you from? Uh, sure. So my name is Brother Peter Gouch. Um, I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. um, I entered the order right after college uh, about three years ago now. Um, what, uh, what drew me to the order was uh, when I was in college, I had the opportunity to, to study with Dominicans in Rome, actually, at a school we run there called the Angelicum. Um, and it was right around that time that I started thinking about religious life. And so uh, I, had, I had been studying with Dominicans and, and thought, well, maybe I should look you know, a little closer at these guys. And uh, the more I saw about how they live out the religious vows, which I was already being drawn uh, and attracted by, um, uh, most of all, I mean, the elements of study and, and, and even preaching were, of course, you know, really foundational for, for my desire to enter the order. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing that really kind of clinched it for me was visiting and seeing how the brothers lived together, um, just the real life of fraternity and how our, our preaching and our ministry kind of flows out from our fraternity and, and, our, and our common prayer life especially. So... Um, now, before you pass, Mike, tell us a little bit more about the charism of the Dominicans. Well, sure. So, uh, so the Dominican order is the order of preachers, um, the OP, order of preachers. Mm -hmm. um, it was uh, founded um, actually almost 800 years ago. Uh, we're coming up on our, on our eighth centenary here um, in a couple of years uh, by uh, a priest um, from Spain named St. Dominic. Um, and uh, actually, there, there's a great story about St. Dominic. Um, he, uh, when he was, you know, a little younger. He, he was preaching in, in the south of France. Um, there had been this, this heresy that had been kind of sweeping Europe, um, basically said that the world was, was evil, created things were evil. Um, and he thought, well, you know, these people need to see the beauty of the truth, that anything that's created by God who is good has to be good. Um, and so he was out preaching against this, and, and he came across an innkeeper um, who, who had, you know, subscribed to these views and who had kind of fallen into this, this heresy. And uh, and so he thought, well, I need to, you know, show this man the, the, the splendor of the truth here. And so he stayed up with him all night long, um, just talking with him and preaching with him and trying to show him the, the beauty of, of the Catholic faith. And, uh, and as the story goes, by morning, the, the innkeeper was converted. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this is, you know, still what Dominicans are doing today. Where, you know, the, the purpose of the order is to preach for the salvation of souls. So. And interesting, didn't he form the, a cloistered group of nuns first? Uh, he did yeah. actually. So uh, he was wise in this regard because he yeah. knew that uh, if the friars were going to be out preaching, they would really need uh, good holy women to be praying for them all the time. So, so they're the real glory of the Dominicans. Uh, hey, <laughs> you know, with, with, it would be a very different story without our nuns, I know that for sure. So. And Brother Athanasius, where are you from? So I'm originally from Long Island, New York, um, and I, that's where I grew up with my family but I attended college in Rhode Island. I went to Providence College, which is a college run by the Dominican Friars of the Eastern Province. And what drew me to the order there was probably uh, towards the end of my sophomore year, I took a very compelling course called Ancient and Medieval Theories of Happiness. And in that course, um, I ended up being a humanities major. We studied a lot of classics, the great works. And the great works we studied um, was basically um, on paper, it described the beauty, truth, and happiness that can be found in radically following Christ. Mm -hmm. And I was falling in love with some of these books. They were great. But what drew me to the order, to the Dominican friars, was to see um, these, these men who were living a happy and joyful life, not just on paper, as in these books, but were giving their life to God in the Dominican order through the charism of preaching. And that's what really kind of uh, made it for me. That's why I wanted to become a Dominican. You know, we hear that story a lot on Life on the Rock, uh, people reading their way into the church or being moved by the classics. What was one of the books that really touched you? So actually following my namesake, um, St. Athanasius wrote a very short book um, titled Life of St. Anthony. Mm -hmm. And it's a story about um, this young man who came from a well-to-do family in Egypt. But upon hearing the words of Christ um, at Mass, in the gospel to sell all you have and give to the poor. You know, by God's grace, he did this. Um, just a short plug for this book. Um, uh, my father, uh, Bob Murphy, loves this book so much, he actually gave it to one of his non-Catholic friends who has read it 40 times and then converted to the Catholicism. Wow. So it's a good read. <laughs> 40 times the charm, right? Yeah, that's right, that's right. <laughs> and that's Anthony of the Desert. Anthony not, of the Desert, yeah. that's right, yeah. Okay, and Brother Humbert. 
Yes, my name is Brother Humbert Kilinowski, and I'm from Columbus, Ohio. So I was born and raised in Connecticut, but I've lived in Ohio since high school. And I first met the Dominican Friars while I was in graduate school at The Ohio State University. I had uh, double majored in math and astronomy as, a, as an undergraduate, and then stuck with math for grad school. And it's it around that time that I was becoming more, more active in my faith. I wanted to, to learn more about it, how to live it, how to practice it. And it was through study, through learning more about, about the faith and how to practice it, that I eventually got to the point where I could, uh, I could see that, that God was drawing me closer to him, close enough that, um, that he was calling me towards religious life and priesthood. And so since I came to know the Dominican friars through St. Patrick's Parish in downtown Columbus, I, um, I, saw, I thought the Dominicans were a natural fit. Plus, they had, for, for 800 years, the Dominicans have been committed to the study and the preaching and teaching of the truth. That's one of the mottos of the order, veritas, truth. And as a mathematician, there's nothing I value more than truth. When, when <laughs> we, 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 uh, we discover what is true, we determine and demonstrate what is true. And from basic first principles, we can reason towards, um, if, towards further truths. And, and from, from the principles of faith, th this, this gets to the, the idea, this is the uh, theology as faith-seeking understanding. And I found that to be very attractive. Plus, the example of the, of the Dominican friars at St. Patrick's Parish, through their, through their solid preaching, through their commitment to a reverent liturgy, and through their very fraternal community life, I found it to be very attractive and made me want to follow in their footsteps. Now you have a, a PhD in mathematics, and some people sitting at home might think, well, you're deep in that world of logic and reason. How do you come to faith? Do you see any difficulty there? I mean, in, um, in, in today's society, you, you often see a, um, a tension between faith and reason because they sort of operate on different planes. Faith, again, comes from knowledge that's revealed, first principles that are revealed from God. We can't come to them by our own reason. We, we, can't, we can't figure them out any other way. And to someone who doesn't give the assent to belief, it seems to be unreasonable because we're asserting things that can't be proven, that, that aren't subject to the methods of knowing what is true through, through reason. But the, the articles of faith, the we can call axioms, as it were, to borrow a term from mathematics, they, um, they're, they're consistent with what we can know by reason. And put, bringing both faith and reason together, they form a, a very cohesive whole of an entire body of knowledge because truth does not contradict truth. And as, as uh, St. John, John Paul II says, faith and reason are the, the two wings by which the human spirit rises towards contemplation of the truth. Is, can you please show us this on a graph or a pie chart? <laughs> some, sort of, uh, some sort of a theorem on the chalkboard? Because I'm, I'm not quite... Yeah, you have, you have chalkboard here? <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't let me hear chalkboard. Yeah. Don't let me hear chalkboard. <laughs> and I think this discussion highlights part of the charism of the Dominicans, too, is that I've always been impressed. I know going to conferences or having Dominican mm -hmm. teachers, uh, just the confidence they have in reason, that they can use it to... You know, seeks understanding, help to explain the faith, and we can use that. It's amazing places uh, you all can get in your theology. I, I went to a conference uh, on, on confession, and they had these Dominican presenters, and I, I know at the end of it, I was just saying, I didn't follow everything you said, but I just, I thank God that you're here, and that you, <laughs> you have this certainty, you know, that somebody's got to figure it figured out, you know? <laughs> If we but could somehow in insert you gentlemen in the White House <laughs> and see if we could bring some civilization to what's going on in the government. So Brother Vincent Ferrer, where are you from? Okay, uh, From Wasika, Minnesota, a small town in southern Minnesota. Um, and went to college <coughs> in Minnesota studying music. Um, I had thought about the priesthood and the religious life a little bit in high school but thought that you really had to be certain to go to seminary or to join an order and then Going to college, um, a Lutheran college, I met actually um, mm. a lot of Catholic friends and uh, two of my closest friends there are actually both converts from Lutheranism who are now either priests or religious. And so just having that, um, having that community um, to grow in faith with and, and so I gradually, as I grew in faith and grew to understand that really joining an order or going to seminary is more about figuring it out mm -hmm. than about being, you know, you don't have to be 100% sure by any means to, to do that, responding to God's grace um, and trusting in Him. 
um, so that was the community and, and the, their example as well was very helpful. One of them is now a Passionist nun in Kentucky, the other is a priest of the Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis. So with that, um, then it was recommended to me to look into the Dominicans for various reasons and as I, um, then I went to actually see them and saw this uh, great thing in reality and for me what, what drew me especially was the synthesis of so many great elements, the, um, the apostolic life with the contemplative life, um, study and preaching and yeah. prayer. Yeah, tell us about that motto, right? The handing on the fruits. Right, mm -hmm. yep. So to contemplate and to hand on the fruits of contemplation to others. Right. That, that in many ways the, uh, the Dominicans took from, from previous, uh, from, from various religious traditions, a uh, sort of life in common together where we come together and pray, but uh, instead of living out in the country and doing manual labor, more living in the city, mm -hmm. being very present to people, to the life of universities, to the life of cities, to the life of the church, um, and putting study at the service of preaching, sort of in place of that, is our form of labor mm -hmm. in particular. And St. Dominic studied at the University of Paris, is that right? Or? One no, of the big universities. No, so he sent his friars out yeah. very early on. So mm -hmm. he, he, he was from Spain originally and, mm -hmm. and studied at, uh, at the cathedral there in, um, in, in, in Osma early on. But he very early on, um, when there were only about 20 friars, he dispersed them all throughout Europe to the, mm -hmm. the just being founded universities of Paris, of Bologna, of Madrid, and sort of, um, so very early on there was a, a link to, uh, he saw the need to be connected to these, first and foremost, so that his, his, his own brothers could learn and could know how to know what the truth was that they needed to preach. Mm -hmm. But then also they very, very quickly became integrated in the, in the act of teaching as well. St. Thomas Aquinas in particular is known in connection to the University of Paris, a second generation Dominican, I suppose you could say. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're a deacon, brother, mm -hmm. right? And so you are preaching now. Mm -hmm. So what is that like? As a Dominican, you're now preaching? Um, it's a great grace to finally, um, you know, just see the, uh, the fruits of that study, mm -hmm. um, being able to be brought to liturgical preaching. Um, yeah, it's uh, with the diaconate just to have that that ministry and especially especially the preaching to sort of um, in a very direct way be able to share uh, the love of Christ that I've come to know and the truth that I've come to know um, and to to share God with others is a great great joy. Was there anything surprising about it that kind of caught you um, off guard? Maybe let's see here. Um, Your brothers are gentle on you. That's right. You know, they're they're they are they are actually you know so they're 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 critical when they need to be, but they 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 they, uh, they let you know when when uh, when you're preaching edified them, which is mm -hmm. helpful, I think, mm -hmm. um, to sort of see what is helpful to people, since that's precisely the point, to be helpful you know, to their salvation. One of our our seminary professors, who I thought was a great preacher, he told us. He said it takes a lifetime to develop a mm -hmm. style and to develop that. So, I yeah, no, I've definitely given homilies that are you know, of varying levels. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you you develop a certain sympathy as well <laughs> for for for, for, the, for what it takes to do it. Yeah, I would just imagine there's a lot of pressure. You order mm -hmm. preachers, you're at the Dominican House of Studies, <laughs> and mm -hmm. all that. Mm -hmm. Our brother Charles, where where are you from? So I'm from Lancaster, Ohio, mm -hmm. a small town near Columbus. Mm -hmm. uh, my family is now in Cincinnati. Uh, I first met the Dominicans at, uh, in Columbus. Uh, Brother Humbert mentions our parish in Columbus, St. Patrick's. Uh, was very impressed with the preaching and the liturgy. Um, but at that time, I really had no inkling of vocation. I was just, uh, I was always, always intellectually committed to the faith. Were you but, working at that time? You were out uh, of no, college? So this was actually in high school oh, high uh, when school. I first okay. met the Dominicans and then went to college, mm -hmm. uh, studied philosophy and Latin and uh, didn't quite know what to do with that uh, when I graduated. <laughs> uh, Would you like fries with that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> so uh, um, I uh, sort of went out on a limb and uh, volunteered for a year in New York City uh, with the Brothers of the Sacred Heart okay. and uh, lived in community with them, taught in one of their schools and uh, to my surprise uh, uh, just really liked it. You know, mm -hmm. living in community with these brothers, praying every day uh, really um, was fulfilling and 
Um, you know, so I, I began to live my faith more seriously, went back to confession, things like this. And uh, uh, the Dominicans were kind of a natural choice for me because I had studied a little St. Thomas in college and the intellectual focus, um, my experience at St. Patrick's. And, um, and so that was that. Uh, I think what, one of the things that really drew me to the Dominicans was, you know, St. Thomas says, grace perfects nature. Um, and I really saw that in the friars that I met, that their faith really enhanced their humanity. Uh, and they could really confidently affirm everything that's naturally true and good and beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. That's a great point. And you even, you were the editor of the Dominican blog for a while. That's right, yeah. And you saw that in writing, right, uh, bringing a beautiful writing and a presentation of, on the blog, a little bit different maybe than other blogging styles? Yeah, yeah, so uh, just a little bit of history. The blog goes b all the way back to, ni uh, I'm sorry, the, the Dominicana <laughs> Journal uh. goes all the way back to 1916. Um, uh -huh. And uh, yeah, not the blog. <laughs> and Al Gore hadn't invented the internet yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that came in the 1920s, I think, yeah. Um, and, uh, it uh, stopped in 1968, and then a few years ago, a couple student brothers said, why don't we start this up again, this mm -hmm. journal? Because mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of brothers again, we can do this. Mm -hmm. And along with that went this blog idea. Oh. Um, and, uh, you know, with our blog, we really try to, um, I think our blog is a little, little more, uh, it's not quite as newsy as most right, blogs are. Right. It's a little more uh, theological, contemplative. Right. Uh, so we try to, we try to uh, maybe take people to a, a more transcendent level. Um, yeah. Contemplative yeah. would mean they're like you're observing and reflecting on things of the day and yeah. Yeah, sure. So taking the truths of the faith and really meditating on them, drawing out the implications, uh, making connections. It's more of a reflection. You know. And I think those two entities you just mentioned, I think capture something about what I hear from the Dominicans like, you know, you revived this journal, okay. and you, it was, well, it was revived in 1968, you said? Or no, it, in 2011. It was revived, but yeah. it went out of business in 68. That's correct. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and so, you, I mean, the, the Dominicans have this great momentum of intellectual thought and structures in place, and it's like the next generation, Dominicans here, are reviving some of those things and adding, you know, the <laughs> blog and, and mm -hmm. film. We've had some of the Dominicans uh, from NYU Film School on and stuff, so. I think that's a great story. Now, Brother Thomas, uh, where are you from? Yeah, so um, I was born in Michigan, but uh, I was born into a military family, and so we ended up moving all over the place. But uh, I spent all, most of the time that was either there in Michigan or in Northern Virginia, near Washington, D.C., where I graduated from high school. And then, uh, like I said, I ran away to California for 10 years for school. <laughs> so I went out, um, studied physics in undergraduate, went on to graduate school. Um, and while I was studying for my Ph.D. In, um, at Stanford is where I met the Dominicans. So the Western province of the Dominicans runs the campus ministry there. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, a, it was a, a great opportunity. I mean, I had thought about the priesthood here and there, but hadn't really, you know, oh, that's something I'll get to later kind of thing. And so when I, when I got to graduate school, um, I just took, I began to take the time to, to think and to pray and sort of take my faith more seriously. Um, and in that prayer, the, the thought of the priesthood and the, and the vocation of the priesthood uh, came, back and came back to my mind. And in particular, the example that I saw in the Dominicans, that I mean, many of the things that, that the brothers have, have been, been mentioning, you know, that um, the life of community, the, the life of, uh, of living together and praying together, the, the life of study and how that study is not just something, something nice to do, but it's, it's really integrated into our life and our, our life of prayer in particular. And so that, that, that idea that our study influences our prayer and that contemplation then leads to our preaching. And for myself, you know, my own studies of physics, you know, I was uh, looking at the, the smallest, most minute parts of matter and seeing just the, the beauty and the order and the structure all the way down there and to see, in a certain sense, God's hand working all the way down to the most minute parts of, uh, of, of the created order. And then to hear, you know, Dominicans talking about that idea of providence, that idea that God has this, this role in every aspect of reality, all the way down to the, to, to the deepest depths of matter, into our own lives, into our, our own, uh, uh, the, the way we act as human beings. 
and to see the, that, that, that acknowledgement and that love of God's providence, his, his providential role uh, in, in, in helping us and guiding us in the way that his grace moves in our lives and sort of through them see, being able to see that providence working in my own life. Mm. So um, with my, my family being more closer to the East Coast than the West Coast, I kind of made the jump back and, and, and have joined the, joined the Eastern Province and it's been a great joy to continue to experience and see that providence working out in so many ways. And what was the title of your dissertation? <laughs> it's going to put me on the spot. <laughs> uh, so uh, it was Monte Carlo simulation of next generation particle cloud. Uh, sorry, Monte Carlo. Uh, even I can't get it right. Uh, <laughs> Mon Monte Carlo simulation of, of, uh, of beyond the standard model collisions at next generation particle colliders. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You read that it's, one? Yeah. <laughs> I saw it on Amazon the other day. Actually. Yeah, yeah. I, I wrote. I wrote <laughs> on. I wrote on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. He was consulting with me. On this movie. <laughs> he was very. Doug was very, very helpful. I mean, I would have got <laughs> yeah. through it wasn't for him. He put yeah. in just 800 words on the blog. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> too, so. I prayed yeah. for it. No. <laughs> We're gonna take a short break. We'll be back uh, with the. East Coast uh, Province Dominicans, don't go away. Back in a moment. <laughs> at the Mass tomorrow, and you recorded some music for us today. Could you introduce the, the songs you, or the hymns you sang? Yeah, so we'll have two pieces right next to each other that both have the same text, the first in Latin and the second being a translation of it in English. Uh, the prayer is the Subtum, which is the first prayer that we know in the church's history that is to Mary. Uh, as early as the third century, the church was praying to Mary, asking for her mercy. So the first chant is a Dominican chant that all of the friars at our house know and sing regularly at Compline. And then the same thing with, uh, with the two you is, is a Polish chant that's harmonized. Okay. So we hope you enjoy the subtuum. Brother Vincent, tell us how uh, you have two albums out. How can mm -hmm. people get a hold of your music? Yeah, so these two pieces actually, the, um, the Subtuum is on the album that's coming out hopefully very soon. Um, and the, um, the To You is on our previous album from last year called In Medio Ecclesiae. The new album is called Ave Maria. And these albums both grow out of our 
uh, liturgical music that we do. Um, and as a matter of fact, they're available on our blog website, so, do, so dominicanablog.com slash records. Um, you can find uh, information about that. So dominicanablog.com, you can find mm -hmm. it there. And um, Doug, you had a question for well, us? Well, yeah, a couple things. Uh, first, I just have to ask this question. What about the dog? Can someone <laughs> tell us about the dog? St. <laughs> Dominic and the dog with the torch in his mouth. This is a famous old story. Hey, Brother Peter, can yeah. tell us. Who, who can tell us best about the dog? I can tell you about the dog. So uh, the dog story is an interesting one. Um, you find it in a few different, uh, the lives of saints, of, of a few different saints. But, um, you know, of course it began with St. Dominic, as we all know. Uh, no, um, but so uh, St. Dominic's mother, Blessed Jane of Azza, uh, uh, as the story goes, um, she had a dream one night of, of a black and white dog. She was, so she was pregnant at the time. And she gave birth to this black and white dog uh, with a torch in its mouth, uh, which ran around the world, setting the world on fire. Um, you, you know, naturally be a little scared if you had this dream, I imagine. <laughs> uh, but, um, but it was, you know, taken to be an image of St. Dominic, of course, with whom she was pregnant, um, who set the world on fire with his preaching, you know, mm. and of course we wear our black and white habits. Um, and there's even a little, a little pun, uh, which I think is kind of interesting. So uh, the, the Latin for Dominicans is Dominicanes, which if you split is Domini Canes, the hounds or the dogs of the Lord. So there's a connection there with the story wow. as well. Uh, so is the black and white choice of habit because of the dream? I don't think so, no. So, <laughs> the, so the white was because um, St. Dominic was uh, what's called a canon. So he lived in community with other priests at a cathedral, mm -hmm. and they lived kind of a religious observance there. They prayed together. And mm -hmm. they wore a white robe similar to the one that we're wearing now. Wow. Um, and I think the black came a little later, uh, but... So that's the reason that. kind of <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, Brother Athanasius, I had a question for you. Uh, you all caught my attention. I heard from one of your Dominican brother priests of this outreach you all had to atheist groups on campus, and that struck me as so bold, you know, to go engage them. Tell us about that, what you all have done. Sure. So over the past couple of years, um, the student brothers, um, uh, during the time of which uh, we're studying to be Catholic priests, Dominican Catholic priests in our house of formation, have also taken some time to just contact um, anywhere from six to eight different um, atheist or secular groups um, who are in the D.C. area. So they could be um, students, graduate students, undergraduate students, they could be um, a little bit older in life, but there's these different collections of um, secular uh, secular Student Alliance who, who want to get together and speak about different subjects relating to atheism. So we just contacted a few of them to see if they wouldn't mind us attending a meeting or maybe even giving a small presentation about the faith and the truths of the faith. You weren't and, picking a fight though, were you? Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say that I was personally trying to pick a fight, no. Um, have I ever gotten into a fight when I got there? Well, <laughs> that's a different story. Um, but um, in, in all seriousness, the, the meetings um, uh, the size of them, it, it'll vary. Sometimes you might be giving a lecture to maybe 50 to 100 uh, students. We did something like that at, uh, at Annapolis. There's an atheist group there our brothers went to. Or it could be a smaller group of, let's say, you know, 10 to 15 students, and you're kind of just participating in the meeting, and they're asking you questions about the faith and reason and how you can reconcile them. So. And it was all very respectful, no raised voices? Or um, I, and I've never gotten a raised voice during a meeting. Yeah. Um, I, I can safely say that the majority of the members have always been very receptive. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the, the coordinator of it, when he kind of realizes that everyone is using the languages, using the language of the Catholic Church to speak about something, mm -hmm. um, he might get a little upset and it's like, wait a minute, this isn't, why are you talking the way he talks? You know, um, so um, that, that happens pretty often. I thought you were telling me that interest earlier. I thought that was very interesting that you'd make a presentation and then they start using your terms and maybe distinctions which is a great progress, right? If you're all talking the same level, that's very helpful, isn't it? Oh, it's, it yeah. certainly is. I think a good way to look at these different atheist dialogues we've had is to say that we try to bring a very rich and f uh, fluent language to these groups of atheists who have probably never heard someone talk like this before. Um, although it might be language that we use all the time in our studentate as we study to be Catholic priests. And um, to see them start speaking about just for example, we gave one talk about happiness, and um, in that we talked about what a nature is. And one of the students um, who, you know, uh, who was an atheist um, at the beginning of the talk, you know, he, um, he was part of the meeting, um, he was talking about, so what does it mean to have a nature? 
Um, and I said, well, it means that you're acting according you know, to, to the end, to the goal that will perfect you, to, to be happy. And he's like, oh, well, then I want to act according to my nature too. <laughs> I was like, all right, good. <laughs> That's a good thing. You know, I think people respond to that. Even like if you talk about male-female differences, I know people listen to that and they kind of, they're curious about themselves, what we're called to, what's in conformity with our natures. I, I think, I mean, it's so remote from our modern thinking, anything about natural law and nature, but people respond, right? We talk about uh, sexuality, human sexuality, and what its purpose is. And we spoke, speak about a Catholic vision it ignites people, I mean, especially our young people. They want to hear some sense of order. Is that what you... I, I think so. I think a lot of young people today, um, they kind of lack an instruction that gives them a comprehensive view of reality. And when they see some kind of structure and order um, that's integral to their own life, how they act every day, um, they, they can latch on to that. They mm -hmm. can really see it as something good. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to take a short break. Be back with the uh, Dominicans of the Eastern Province, so don't go away. Back in a moment. Right, Doug, you have a question for Yeah, I just don't think we can let Dominicans go without asking them about the rosary. Sure. All right, because the rosary as we know it today, it really came to us from the Blessed Mother through St. Dominic. That's, that's kind of the general understanding. Can someone just speak briefly to, to, to Our Lady's, you know, you know, connection with St. Dominic and what we all now have in the rosary today? So our... Um, yeah, the, the they tradition needed to is contemplate yeah. that for a couple of seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Our, right, go, brother. The tradition is that that um, Saint Dominic received the Rosary from Our Lady, and we. But the Dominicans uh, have always had a strong devotion to Our Lady. Um, the stories of, of the way Our Lady interceded in the life of Saint Dominic himself and in the early friars mm -hmm. are, are well loved among the brethren. And you know, if you you know, it's 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 hidden under it's hidden under these uh, these robes. But we all have our own uh, our own Rosary that we wear. We carry them everywhere we go, um, and we pray them together in the in the house as a community each day, um, and we are encouraged uh, not just you know nicely, but even in our in our constitutions itself, it says we are encouraged to preach the rosary, mm -hmm. and to to speak about the power and the the beauty of this devotion and and of of uh, the devotion to our, our Lady in general and particularly through the rosary. And so it becomes uh, an important part in the life of, of, of every Dominican. You have wonderful stories of older friars and, and their love of the rosary and the preaching and what it did for them in their lives. And so uh, it's something that we all hold very dear and carry with us everywhere we go. That's great. And Brother Humber, do you have something to add to that? Or? It's, uh, something quickly. Uh, the, the rosary, it's a, it's a prayer that engages the entire person. I mean, we, we're meditating on the great mysteries of, of salvation, of, of how God, in, in his great love for us, became man and um, suffered and died for us, rose from the dead, and leads us to follow him into, into his glory in eternal life. And so we meditate on these mysteries. We also repeat the words of prayer of intercession to, to Mary, asking for her help to, to lead us along this path that God has set out for us. Yeah. Okay. And we have another music video. Brother Vincent, would you set that up for mm -hmm. us? Sure. So this last one is, is Confitemini Domino. It is a piece by Palestrina, a uh, great composer in all of music from the, from the Renaissance period. And this, again, is something that we've done, the Scola has done at our house liturgy and something we thought we should, we should share both here and on our In Medio Ecclesia album. Mm -hmm. so. so enjoy this piece by Palestrina.
you all are engaged in the culture evangelizing through truth and through beauty, tell us more about your work through beauty, Brother Athanasius. Sure. So there have been a couple of times in the past few years during Christmas and other parts of the year where we're either just sing songs in the streets of Washington, D.C., or especially during the Christmas season. So songs like you just heard us sing will be chanting um, at some busy corner uh, near a, a metro or a subway station in D.C. And um, I remember one time in particular, a few years ago, um, we had our, our scola, our group of brothers, singing off to one side, and people were passing by, taking pictures and listening to us. Well, we also had a few friars just kind of standing um, a, few, a few yards away, ready to, to talk, to pray with anybody, to answer any questions they might have. So as some of my brothers were kind of uh, engaging some other people who were listening, um, one uh, lady came up to me. And as she walked up to me, she said, are you a Catholic brother? And I said, yes, I am. And she says, well, I have something to tell you. And I'm, I'm, ready, I'm ready to listen to her. <laughs> and she says, well, um, um, I'm not a Christian. Uh, I don't have faith. And I don't believe in God. But there are many things that I want to tell you that I think about your Catholic church, she said. And as she did this, she started to list all these things that she had a problem with about the Catholic Church. Um, and what I noticed was as I was trying to engage her or make eye contact with her, she just kept looking off to the side and listing all these things that she was complaining about or had trouble with. So I'm just kind of patiently waiting to start having a dialogue with her. Um, but as she was speaking and listing all these things, she keeps looking over to the left where our singers are. And as she's going, you know, and I just have a problem with and I just, are, are they singing my favorite Christmas song, <laughs> she said. <laughs> and um, I didn't say anything at that point. I just said, oh, um, well, why don't we just turn and listen? So we did. And as they were singing, I think it was Low How a Rose Are Blooming or Silent Night, um, she turned back to me after it was done. And for the first time, looking me in the eye, was, uh, she said to me, um, who did you say you were again? Like, what are you, <laughs> well, what are you doing out here? Who are um, you people? <laughs> and as we explained what it means to be a Catholic brother and to give all you have to Christ through the act of love that he gives you in grace, um, she says, oh, that's, that's amazing. Thank you so much for, for studying to be a priest. You know, I, I, wish, I wish you all, you know, the best. Yeah. Good luck in, in, in your vocations. Um, and, then she, and then she went on her way. Yeah. But after it was done, I was like, what? What just happened, yeah. you know? Um, clearly, God was, was softening her heart at that moment. Um, and it was through this, uh, through this beautiful music we were singing. I, I said very little during the conversation at all. Right. So, uh, Brother Thomas, I want to ask you, you have a physics degree from Caltech, sure. from Stanford, and you work, sometimes you engage atheists and things that, from the scientific community. Sure, I mean, there's, so, there's opportunities in various ways. I mean, I think one of the biggest problems that you have is that most people you know, Brother Athens just mentioned the idea of a coherent view of the world. Um, in, in today's culture, when people think of a coherent view of the world, religion is often the last place they think to, to they're going to find it, because their impression of, of the faith is that it's, uh, it's irrational. It's just about, um, okay, here, here, here's a book, read this book, memorize this book, believe everything in it, and you're done. Mm -hmm. um, and so the opportunity to just present yourself as someone who doesn't reject what has been, what, what, what you know, we, we've learned through modern science and is able to coherently talk about the faith in a way that is, is, is healthy, in a way that, that is not uh, uh, irrational, surprises them. It absolutely surprises them. And it's not just me. I mean, any of my brothers can do this uh, and, and do do this. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, you know, when I mentioned I have a PhD in physics, it does kind of shock them a little bit. Uh, um, That's but I top think of the academic it, food chain. Yeah, in, in, in a healthy <laughs> way, I guess. But it's also been an opportunity then to help and talk with other Catholics and other people about this as well right. and open up this to the broader culture. Right. Well, thank you so much for your witness and coming down and look forward to touching base and hearing the great works that you guys are doing in the future. So well, may our Heavenly Father shine His face upon you. May He give you His peace. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll see you next week.